In this series, I'll be focusing on one of the game mechanics and dig deep into it. This allows me to think about the game's potential, imagine what's coming, and gets me more excited about it. First in this series of the game of Oathlone, let's focus on heroes or playable characters called Oathlones. Oathlones are playable characters, heroes, or champions equivalent in other games and this is what each player controls in a game of Old Throne into the deep wood. Since it is confusing to call heroes as Old Throne because it is the name of the game and game does not call them heroes, from here on I generally refer to these as playable character. In some other games, these characters may be a direct reflection of a player. For example, Magic the Gathering, a player will be attacking another player. In tabletop RPG, one can still have player representing him or herself and have equipment, role, and other things. But I personally think it's more fun to have a character that you control having actual art, theme, and own background story. Looking at the actual playable character card, we can tell each oath loan have might, defense, HP, special ability, Animus and equipment restrictions. Might is a representation of an attack points in this game. In Oathlone, combat attack is determined by sum of dice roll or card drawn. In this game, player will decide how many base white dice to roll or card to draw. If two or more dice rolled are blank, the entire attack is considered missed. So what might represent is how many and what color upgraded dice the character can roll during each attack. Weakest to the strongest, the order of strength of the dice colors are white, yellow, red, and black. For example, if an old one equips short bow, he or she gets an yellow dice on might. So in each attack, that old one is allowed to roll one yellow dice and any number of white dice. Defense is a parameter, not surprisingly, reduces the amount of damage one will incur during an attack. Unlike more conventional method of calculation, in the game of Oathlone, the total damage is determined by total attack points divided by defense points with all decimals dropped off. For example, total attack you rolled for an enemy creature targeting your character, in this game you roll your own doom, was 10, and your character was 3 defense, 10 divided by 3 is 3.33, so after ignoring decimals, this is 3. The damage inflicted to your Oathlone in this case is therefore 3. Total health points for each Oathlone at starting, possibly even until the end of game, is merely 6. This appears rather low number to have. However, because damage reduction with defense value in this game is a division rather than subtraction, if you gain 2 base defense, it is similar to saying you now have 12 HP, and with 3 defense, it's 18 HP. Basically, in this game, each HP point scales up as Oathworm gains more defense. Each Oathworm has characteristic, often playstyle, aiding built into the special abilities. The special ability have both thematic and mechanical synergy with the ability cards, giving unique feel for each oath form. We will look this more carefully later. Animus is a resource point in this game. Number of animus regenerates at the start of each turn is a potentially changing parameter. At the start of game, this is 6. Also, there are maximum animus one can hold despite one can save and carry over and use animus to following turn. Basically, no matter how much animus you save, you cannot go over the maximum. Both of these numbers will change as you progress the story. Main customization of your character comes from equipment, along with selection of which ability cards to include in your 7. 
different characters have different restrictions of what equipment type one can equip. This is not an uncommon approach in hero-based card game. This type of game design allows control synergy and minimize the risk of unintentional synergy, breaking the game balance. This allows creation of generally more powerful cards in the game. Equipment cards often have a unique active effect, but these effects can only be executed once during an encounter. However, equipment cards may have passive effect or give might, base defense to change, also on start throughout the entire encounter. Character cards shows other stats that are not shown on Othwon cards, which are represented by combat tokens. Each Othwon levels up after every chapter or encounter, hence there's no experience points in this game. General game design decision this game have taken appears reducing complexity while keeping fun and excitement. For example, most players of the any game enjoy boss battle over the experience or material grinding encounters in order to just level up your character or craft a legendary equipment. Every encounter in Oathwon supposedly is a boss battle. Therefore, by defeating them, you level up after each encounter. Based on the character card, regeneration and maximum animus can change over the course. Also, we can think of each of five types of combat tokens as separate stats for a character. These tokens are consumable tokens that each Oathwon can use during an encounter. Besides character level, equipment, decisions on story part of campaign, ties, encounter, and story parts with tokens. Shadowbone took an extra step to make this game solo play friendly, rather than just solo playable. The main mechanics to support this is Companion System. Companion is an abbreviated version of Oathwon. Companions have simplified stats when compared to full Oathwon. Each companion has three archetype cards in contrast to seven ability cards on full Oathwon. After the huge success on Kickstarter campaign with multiple unlocked stretch goals, the game will have 12 Oathwons. The game will always use four Oathwons to form a party called Free Company in this game. This gives over 400 potential combinations of Free Company. Each Oathwons are designed to be unique in its playstyle, which is implemented by combination of each Oathwons specific ability cards, deck, and supporting special ability. For each encounter, a full playable character must choose 7 ability cards to take to the battle. In the end, there will be 15 ability cards for each class to choose from with the exception of Huntress and Witch who have more cards to choose from. Now, let's take a close look at each of 12 Oathwons and their ability cards that I could find online. The first is a V Havinger. A V is one of three playable original creature in the world of Oathwon. The theme of this character is supernatural power, such as seeing a future and bending time, world of physics. The paradigmatic ability card here is Fate Weaver. This card costs 0, and if you guess incorrectly, it drops to battle flow 1 position, so it should be relatively easy to retrieve it back to hand next turn, or at the very latest, following turn with relatively minimum effort. At first, it may appear a statistically unfavorable guessing game if you were to choose between 1 and 6 randomly, but in reality, one should be able to guess far better than that. First, one would know enemy's attack capability, and your defense. Hence, maximum health loss can be calculated and most of the time it won't be 5 or 6. Also, losing 1 or perhaps 2 health may not be your fear. These types of tactical decisions make this card more than just guesswork. Foreshadowing is another thematically fitting card. Looking opponent's top deck and putting into the bottom of the deck is a common mechanics in the strategy card game, but it is indeed changing the future. Given there are only 15 ability cards for most playable characters, I'm not sure if variant of this card will be in an emphasis, but based on the strategy card game, I won't be surprised if we see card like look top X cards and put them in any order. This is not just changing future, but defining the future of enemy. Prophetic Fulfillment is a thematically fitting heal card for Avi. This ability basically heals one health of a target player character, 
but it takes a quite bit of setup. At first, this card uses three animas to tag a target. At this point, you really haven't done anything. In order to heal, you have to wait until this card to return back to your hand. At least its cooldown value is 1, so without too much effort, the card should come back into hand 1 to 2 turns. But in order to have this card do its heal, you have to use this again. One thing to note here is though, is when you use it second time and after, it has healing of current tag character plus tagging next character. So more you use average of the card effect cost gets closer to 3 animus than from original 6 animus total cost. In strategy card games, when a card requires a bit of a setup and time before doing its effect are often but bad card. We will see if prophetic fulfillment will make a cut for one of precious 7 slot in AV player. Quickening is a support card interacting with battle flow mechanics. All 4 cards revealed here are supporting cards. So based on these and the visual of AV, AV's primary role is for sure supporter. However, Kickstarter states not only a support character, the Havinger, are also viciously fast and capable of deadly bursts of speed that can deal heavy damage to his enemies by blade, staff, talon, and even at the range with his own quail. Based on such statement, I wonder if there are enough cards to allow player to make a V take rogue type role, which is high movement attacker with deflection of attack via utility of its movement or means of other than relying on sheer defense. Next is blade. As a blade player, one must decide which stance to use at the beginning of each turn. The proper stance make each ability card to show their full potential. Crosscut is a card if you are in viper sense, it will give you one additional attack. Blade Call looks like an interesting card because this is the first card I am seeing to force enemy to attack under your will. At first, the obvious benefit of this is to take opponent's dice as yours and boosting damage to opponents while reducing loss of your health. Potential of this card, I believe, is synergy trigger of when opponents attack. Based on how the texts are written, I assume perfect form can be used here. With perfect form, player needs total of 7 animus to execute this synergy, but with it, you can really take opponent's attack back to them as additional attack. This is especially satisfying because with 3 additional defense, and you get to choose 2 dices cards from opponent's attack, you have pretty good control avoiding any damage inflicted on you. Back to Blade Call. If the game rule allows, how about using a card for defense which costs no animus? Defense card triggers battle flow, so some may potentially use this to manipulate battle flow during your own turn. Cleaving Slide illustrates the thematic part of the Blade's mobile attack ability. Movement and attack are tied here. With these cards, Blade's primary role would obviously get to be a warrior. Car is a character who has built-in intentional synergy via means of future ability cost reduction or boosting the effect of the ability. This is one of the stretch goal added character and I could not find any sample card. Interesting description here says the car can put out an incredible amount of damage but is lightly armored. Therefore, he relies on his array of interrupts and battle flow manipulations to make sure he is not caught flat-footed when the enemy attacks. This sounds like he may be the one character utilizing battle flow system as its core mechanics. I see battle flow system with the interrupts as a potential design space of reactive playstyle in Orthlone into the deep wood. In the strategy card game, Playstyle are often classified into three primary archetypes, aggro, control, and combo. Combo in this classification refers to play synergy that is so strong, it is nearly essential win condition if combo can be achieved. I cannot imagine cards combo will be enough to meet this criteria. So I rather, and I hope, his playstyle is more of a control archetype equivalent in the PvP card game.
Kyra is for sure rogue role character. Next up is Exile. Visually, Exile for sure will be in a warrior class or role. While there are few cards, rotate cooldown by one, they are pretty much targeting a single card. Whereas Exile's open wound special ability rotates all cards. Since it uses HP, and I assume there aren't too many options, if any, of healing on Exile, it is unlikely to be able to use this ability more than once maybe twice during an encounter. This can be a quite strong ability when used at proper timing though. Leap Attack Although it does not cost anything for your character nor enemy to change their orientation in this game, our card like Leap Attack takes advantage of this potential game design space of the fact that each characters have orientation. Headbutt looks like a simple intercept card for Exile. Although most cards I have seen in this game usually use 3 animus for standard attack, so options of 2 animus for attack confirms his role as a warrior. Reeb appears a counterpart of Cleaving Slide in a Blade. Weapon Throw looks an interesting card from game mechanics perspective. I'm curious if loss of a weapon happens before or after the attack using this card, because before means I assume you lose all might dice for the attack. Tree Crime is thematically and mechanically interesting card. This is an ability exemplifying the interaction of the characters with terrain elements. This is design space I certainly could not experience with conventional PvP strategy card game. Grove Maiden is a token generating playstyle character. Although this is one of the Orthron who I haven't seen its special ability, I'm fairly certain it relates to token generation. Raised Sentinel states Sentinels are immovable. The card capability of double up and spawning two Sentinels with a single card use is a nice option. The bottom option of ranged attack is interesting. If I interpret this correctly, we get double the might, which means very powerful attack. Perhaps types of weapons she can equip are limited to balance this out. Once Sentinels are spawned, it's a time to attack. Nature's Fury is analogous to Swarm Attack in the strategy card game. It is still unclear if Sentinel's attack uses Groove of Maiden's Might. Thorns is a counter attack ability. Cooldown value of 3 and defense of 3 requires some tactical decision to make for when to use this card as intercept. Since counter attack is based on the damage on the dice rather than actual HP loss, so this may do some serious damage to enemy. Rope Vine looks like a decent support card at one animus cost, especially in early chapters. Huntress is a community created or selected playable character from the Kickstarter campaign. Normally, each class has 15 ability cards to choose from, but Huntress and which are exceptions. The most class defining unique mechanics for Huntress is unequivocally Falcons. Hunter's Call looks to be the primary ability card to move Falcons. Its animus cost and cooldown value appear low, but moving Falcons are just tagging target and by itself it does nothing, so I think it's a reasonable cost. Similar to the Hunter's Call, I wonder if Avi's prophetic fulfillment can be revised such that when it's tagging, it's just one cost card while when it's healing, it's higher cost. Death Dive is an attacking order to Falcons, both thematically and mechanically. I like Falcon's attack can't be missed. Also, limitation of 4 dice ensure Falcon attack is not overpowered. Hinder is a way to use Falcon for defense support. Interesting th thing to note here is that Falcon is tagging friendly ally on this card, whereas Death Dive was tagging enemy. So one need to choose how to use Falcon at the time of tagging. Eye Gouge is an example of supporting ability when Falcon tags enemy. According to Kickstarter, on top of her many Falcony abilities that can buff or hamper others, she also has a set of abilities centered around the bow and melee weapon proficiency. Spear and polearm attacks focus on killing blows and combination attacks with her Falcons. Wallace, the bow gives her a range supremacy that gives her even more ability to control her falcons. Oh, and she has traps that can be laid in path of her prey 
and even one that can be triggered to explode when shot from range. The Huntress embodies versatility in combat and no matter which path she chooses, one thing is for sure, she will become the master of it. During the campaign, one of the alternative choice to Huntress was Trapper, so I am really grateful that developers decided to keep trap mechanics and making into the Huntress. Overall, it looks like Huntress may be the most versatile class amongst 12 playable characters with potentially taking Ranger, Warrior, and support primary roles. Next up is Priest. Priest is obviously a healer class, but healing HP in the world of Oathworn is not a simple task. Heavy Blow is a must-include card in the Priest. The must-include card, I believe, is a cycle, and every class has one. If you want to use this as a healing ability, it costs 5 animus and have to be next to the target-friendly ally, and costing own HP. However, his special ability regains health point every turn, so Priest's health is not as precious as the others. By the way, Heavy Blow shows the fact that ability card in this game can be essentially a container for multiple cards. In other games, this card can be divided into four separate cards, sharing common cooldown and defense values. One complaint I have here is, I wish developer didn't call this card Heavy Blow. It does not make sense to give a Heavy Blow to an ally and that heals an ally. They could call it with more generic name on top, such as Priest Mission. Then, just before text description of each options, they can put actual name of the action. So player can refer to as, I'm going to use priest mission, heavy blow action. Healing touch costs less than the half animus to heal adjacent ally. The trade-off here is that one could miss it, but the rate of success is inversely proportional to target HP. This is indeed need based. As lower the target health is, more you want it to get healed. Priest in game of Oathrun is not a typical standing or perhaps hiding backline fragile supporter. Weight of Glory shows priest attack can knock back target. If the target collides with an obstacle or other character due to knockback effect, that's an automatic 1 HP loss independent of defense value. Now having said this, he still fulfills expected supporter role with this card via potentially giving defense to ally. Player of Protection is another supporting ability Priests can give protection to ally. At the rate of 1 protection for 1 animus, with 3 total protections, this looks pretty good card. Baseline attack cost for priest is 3 animus. So for 1 animus, pillar and path can get you either reroll or protection token on top of it. Assuming hex icon with 3 arrows means 3 front hexes, sanctify is an attack with knockback but at the additional cost of 1 HP. Though again, Priest HP is not as precious as others due to its self-healing special ability each turn. It looks like, in the world of Oathworn, Priest is more than just a supporter role. He could well be a defender or tank role. According to the Kickstarter campaign website, Penitent is supposed to take a role of tank or defender which makes sense visually. I could only find a single sample card, so it is difficult to say how uniquely he achieves this role. Although Repel has a knockback effect, it can only do max damage of 1 to a particular enemy, and therefore, the role of this card is most likely related to actual knockback effect, i.e. moving the enemy, rather than damaging the enemy. Now, let's talk about Ranger. Ranger's special ability should give you a deja vu because this is fairly similar to Exile's ability card, Tree Climb. Exile's Tree Climb is more powerful version of Ranger's Tree Running with added 2 attack after the move and movement is allowed between any terrain rather than limited to trees. This comes at the cost of twice the required animus and being ability card rather than special ability. Ranger is what we expect from the typical Ranger class in other games. This is a class specialized in ranged attack. In this game, Ranger can only equip bow for its weapon. Loose Aloe is a must-include card for Ranger. 
This is analogous to that of heavy blow in priest. In fact, the only difference is that heavy blow of priest has fourth option of healing HP. I think it looks better if they can make these cards as a basic action analogous to the special action or ability on the Elseworlds card. And then they can actually use the additional slot for other more unique ability cards. When I originally read Thread the Needle's text, I thought this card was unnecessarily restrictive because not only you need to attack from the enemy's rear, but your target location must be rear in order to get plus two bonus points. So I thought once you destroy the rear, this card becomes just a regular three animus attack card. However, this interpretation turned out to be not correct. According to the developer, Jamie, on YouTube video with Dice Tower playthrough video, the attack targeting destroyed location allows you to target adjacent location. So even after destroying the rear, we should still be able to use Thread the Needle to target either core or flank to get plus 2 bonus. As defense in this game divides attack for final damage, taking down two defense sounds significant. Though given requirement of a specific position and four or more starting defense, this may be a bit situational, especially a ranger probably don't want to be so close to enemy and risking herself to be a next enemy's attack target in subsequent encounter phase. However, in Oathworn, characters can move after attack as long as you still have animus to do so. So I'd assume most will follow some sort of movement after use of Barakin. If one decides to take a risk and perform melee attack with a ranger, double stop is the card to use. I would assume ignored dice cannot be blank dice as it says the lowest numbered. Flensing round gives damaged enemy bleeding effect. Bleeding character will lose 1 HP each turn. Similar to thread the needle, this ability also has a specific location bonus. Multi-shot is area of effect attack for ranger. I believe front arc means anything front including the range, especially the last sentence essentially saying this won't work for melee combat. So the range of this attack will change based on the equipment. Ricochet is another area of effect attack for the ranger class. Based on how the text is written, I believe you can use this to attack an enemy beyond your range by assigning all damage to the furthest, otherwise unreachable target. One would expect Ranger to protect herself anything but via physical defense with a bulky armor. Backflip is basic concept of hit and run for Ranger. Child of the Forest is the paradigmatic defense card of the Ranger. It will be interesting if there is a card or ability that one can grow tree during an encounter, especially there are other tree terrain using abilities in the game. Tripwire is the first actual example of trap card in the Old Throne. The text is slightly confusing, but essentially if the enemy moves into the hex where tripwire marker is set, it forces the enemy to stop moving as well as its attack. Along with Avi and Idendri, Warbear is another original creature in the world of Oathlorn. Warbear looks like a tank, and he indeed is. I believe Endurance special ability is just a flavor text and have no actual in-game effect. With cooldown value of 1, Ironhide may not be surprised to grant Warbear handful defense tokens during a single encounter. Swipe is a simple area of effect attack that we also seen in the Warden class. With knockback of 3, Battle will likely to add an extra HP damage to target more often than not. At its high cost of 6 Animus, Great Feet minimizes the risk of miss, assuming you won't stretch your luck too far. Besides its attack ability, Great Feet gives the highest defense value in any of the cards I've seen so far. Arsa seems to have quite a few cards with knockback. Amongst the examples, Toss shows thematic power of Arsa's with tactical use given cascade effect of knockback and this provides. Topple is a conceptually interesting card. This is clearly a damage attack ability but via use of obstacles. 
Assume obstacle includes all terrains. If you are like myself, one might have dreamed use of topple to an enemy boss occupying all six hexes with a single shot kill. But I believe each location will be treated differently, so it will be only one damage to each location. This is a situational card, but it may give occasional memorable epic moment. Fair Roar is a commander-like team support ability. If one can build a character with more of these group support ability cards, this can be a full class itself. Anyways, Fell Roar may be a staple first move, assuming all, if not most encounters, starts with all three company members next to each other. Even though Bite appears as primary and interrupt card to reduce enemies' attack, this card alternatively allows Arsus to attack for only two animus, whereas other cards cost you three animus. Bite also has potential to give three defenses, so this card appears to be more than just simple interrupt utility. Which class is an expert on the massive area of effect by casting spells? The magic system implementation in this game is creative. In order for the witch to be able to cast the spells, she needs to first do some setup on the field. Thematically, this is like her needing to set up magic circle before able to use any magic. This provides another layer of resource system management when witch is chosen as a player of choice. Using witch's special ability, water or fire hexes are built on the battlefield. These fields have their own effect. Water field will slow down movement, costing two extra animus to move through the hex. Fire field has potential to damage a character walks through it. However, these fields are created not for the primary purpose of these field effect, but to fill powerful magic spells. Lash Out is a must include cycle card for Witch. Once again, there really isn't much difference here when compared to other must include card cycle except attack range specification in comparison to Loose Arrow for Ranger or No Healing when compared to Priest Heavy Blow. Supernova is the first card with a bonus effect when a specific type of equipment is equipped, in this case a staff. Fireworm would definitely make a cool visual effect if it was on the video game. This card illustrates field setup is not just for resource but also itself can boost effect of a spell. In this case, area of effect will increase whenever fireworms landing hex is a fire field. Fireball is another area of effect attack card. Although slightly more situational, Fireworm seems better as it can affect much wider area. But looking at the cost of Fireball, it costs more animus and cooldown values than the Fireworm. So I assume developers found out potential plus one attack is significant enough upgrade. Alternatively, Fireworm is level two card and Fireball is starting card, so perhaps Fireworm is in this superior version of Fireball. Though you may still need both cards if your intent is to become a Pyromancer. Telekinesis Implosion's primary utility is knockback effect based on attack. However, because it says all characters rather than specifying enemy, we may potentially see a rare use of bringing all allies adjacent to each other for potential setup to the card that gives benefits to those adjacent to the specific ally. Chain Lightning demonstrates intentional synergy between Warden and Witch class. Warden can be tactically placed in a position to allow Chain of Lightning to affect otherwise unreachable target. This brings us to the last of the 12 Oathworn, Warden. From the storyline, the main theme of the Warden is its synergy with Witch. But Warden takes defender role in free company with or without Witch. Since the specific ability Mantle states Warden can lose HP from spell but he will negate party member witch spell, I believe this is a confirmation that at least one enemy we are going to fight will cast spell. Chain Drag is conceptually interesting card. Knockback effect gives max 1 damage to the target enemy assuming obstacle on its path even though it costs only 2 animus. I'm not certain how effective this card is for top ability. The bottom ability requires witch in the party, so perhaps this card is really for those trying to maximize synergy with witch.
In this type of game, Taunt is a must exist card. This is paradigmatic card for a defender role. Guard is another card illustrating Warden really specializing the defender role in a free company. Arcing Strike is identical to Swipe in the Ursus Warbear. As one, it's a supportive card helping allied stamina. I'm fairly certain the icon with foot with arrow represent Immobilize. This can be a lifesaver card in some situations. Although dice roll itself are purely luck based, Claimed ground have enough elements allow you to predict and control favorable outcomes as both number of adjacent enemies as well as defense value changes the chance. If I ever decide to make a strategy or tactical guide, these are the things I like to write about. Shield Bash is a mechanically interesting card. This, cause, this card uses defense value for its attack. For the cards I've seen so far, Warden is the only one who has ability cards that utilizes his defense value as a part of attack mechanics. In summary, the developers have chosen to take a path to balance between complexity and depth of the game. From PvP strategy card gamers' perspective, Orthrone playable characters' fundamental design complexity is somewhere right in the middle probably analogous to games like a Shadow Era in the digital card games for the game design space depth, rather than taking simple is the best approach with a game like Hearthstone, or complexity for maximum depth yet requiring professional judge like Magic the Gathering. Intentional variation in playstyle amongst the different playable characters looks fairly well designed. Some characters appear to have design attempt to provide variation of playstyle even within the character class itself, such as in Witch and Huntress. In these types of game, for the best replayability, I truly hope there will be a design level support of a playstyle variation within the class for every single 12 Orthrones. I feel game needs some simplification on the card text. For example, many ability cards second ability option is a simple attack mostly for 3 animus, occasional 2 animus. They can make these into a simple attack icon with costs like how they are doing for defense value. Also, must include card cycle looks to me can be made into basic ability similar to how they are doing for special ability on each oath one cards. These changes will allow more text space on each card as well as opening up one more card for player to choose. In the end, these will give more options to player. Have you decided who are your full free company members? Have you already seen any cool synergy or combo? Please share them on the comment below.